Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over Bell's palsy. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Go ahead and press that thumbs up now so you don't forget. You're going to love the video, so just like it now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews. You can book a NCLEX review private tutoring session or consultation session. You can reserve your spot now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available. The audio lessons are for current nursing students. You're in the, you haven't graduated, you're in the program right now, but you are struggling. You need a really, really, really high grade on your next exam to get through go to my audio lessons. It will help you a lot. Um, also, guys, don't forget that you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So be sure to check me out there. All right, guys, let's get into it. Cerebral palsy. This book is old, so don't mind. Don't mind it. Just take a look. Cerebral palsy. You'll see that I wrote CN7. That's for cranial nerve seven. That's important for you to know this is a nerve that's affected. Okay. So in cerebral palsy, this is an acute peripheral nerve per paresis of unknown cause. Let's stop right there. Remember I told you whenever you're studying, if you see a word that you don't understand or you don't know, look it up. Don't just skip over it. Right? So what's happening in, uh, in Bell's palsy the patient's having facial paresis. What is paresis? That's like um, uh, muscle weakness, but the muscle weakness is due to nerves. Something's wrong with the nerves. It's the nerves that's causing the, the muscle weakness, okay? So Bell's palsy is an acute peripheral facial weakness facial paresis, that weakness caused by a nerve of unknown cause. We don't know what causes Bell's palsy. We have no idea. We know there are links, but we don't know what the exact cause is, okay? It's characterized by inflammation of the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. You need to know that. On one side, meaning unilateral of the face in the absence of any other disease, such as a stroke. So the patient's having inflammation of the cranial nerve seven, the patient's having one-sided facial weakness, and there's no other disease or disorder that can um, that is present that may be causing this. So it's not that the patient's having a stroke, okay? Bell's palsy is considered benign. It won't kill you. Most patients recovery, recover excuse me, spontaneously within three weeks to nine months. Take a look at the etiology and patho. The most strongly supported cause is reactivation of herpes simplex virus. So the patient was infected and now what happened is it was dormant and then it became reactivated. That's what the thought is. But we're not 100% sure because guess what? We've had patient with Bell's palsy with no history of herpes simplex virus infection. This patient with Bell's palsy, um, they will look like they had a stroke. You know how the stroke patients will have the unilateral, the one-sided facial drooping, um, facial weakness, same thing. But the thing is um, in stroke, hold on, matter of fact, I'll, I'll come back to that. Stroke, if the patient had a stroke, that has to do with what? The brain, right? Patient may have an aneurysm. They had a weakness in that vessel. But in cerebral palsy, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, cranial nerve seven, two different things. So the patient may share characteristics of a, someone who had a stroke, but it's not the same disorder. They're completely different. Take a look, guys. Inability to wrinkle their brow. Why? Because of that muscle weakness. Drooping eyelid because of that muscle weakness. Inability to close the eye because of that muscle weakness. Inability to puff out cheeks because of that muscle weakness. Drooping mouth because of that muscle weakness. If you notice on the other side, she can lift, she can smile. She can um, lift um, her, her lips her eyes, right? But on this side here, because of the muscle weakness, it's causing all of this. Remember, this is one-sided and the patient does not feel pain. 
If the patient felt pain, we most likely would be talking about trigeminal neuralgia. That's something else. That's another uh, video for another day. But in Bell's palsy, there is no pain. There's one-sided facial weakness, but no pain. That's very important to know. Clinical manifestations. The onset of Bell's palsy is sudden with is sudden with a rapid of unilateral. We're seeing that word again, guys. Unilateral facial pain. So it's one side. Did I just say facial pain? Facial weakness. Forgive me. <laughs> so we're seeing one-sided facial weakness. It's not going to be bilateral. It's going to be on one side of the face. Many patients have a history of a recent viral illness. This has been seen on HESI many, 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 many times. If you're at the school where they're giving the HESI, make sure you know this. Patient's going to have numbness of the face, tongue, ear, tinnitus, that's the ringing of the ear, headache, and hearing deficit. Flaccidity of the affected side of the face with drooping of the mouth accompanied by drooling. Uh-oh, why don't I have drooling highlighted? Let me highlight that because that's very important. Why is that very important? Airway, we're concerned about what? Aspiration. Bell's phenomenon an inability to close the eyelid with an upward movement of the eyeball when closure is attempted is a ding, 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 hallmark sign of Bell's palsy. That word hallmark, when you are studying and you see the word hallmark, stop. Reread it again and know that you need to know it for exam. Hallmark means this is characteristic. If we see this, we need to be thinking of that, okay? Bell's phenomenon, that is a hallmark sign of Bell's palsy. So you need to know what that uh, Bell's phenomenon looks like, that inability for them to close the eyelid with the upper movement of the eyeball. Just knowing that, just knowing phenomenon, uh, Bell's phenomenon is a hallmark, we know that we're going to be concerned about that patient's vision, right? You have to be able to shut your eyelids so your eyeballs can be lubricated so you don't have corneal ulcerations. All right, let's keep going. Patient may have inability to smile, frown, or whistle. Remember that one-sided, that unilateral uh, muscle weakness that they have. Diagnostic studies. And you see what I wrote here, rule out stroke. Why? Because their symptoms are so close to the, a stroke, we want to make sure that it's not a stroke and something else. So we're going to rule out stroke. Diagnosis of Bell's palsy is by exclusion, excluding everything out, ev excluding everything else out, starting with a stroke. There's no definitive diagnostic test that exists for Bell's palsy. We have to rule other things out, okay? The diagnosis and prognosis are indicated by observing the typical pattern, typical pattern, everything I just went over that one-sided weakness, the Bell's phenomenon, okay? The typical pattern of onset and signs testing percutaneous nerve excitability by electromyography, that's the EMG. Patients should be referred to a neurologist or a tolerangeologist. I, I, I completely killed that word, but you guys see it, this word right here, okay? That specialist, as soon as possible to exclude other neurological conditions. Interprofessional care. It says treatment of Bell's palsy includes, this is what you're gonna do, moist heat, gentle massage, electrical stimulation of the nerve and prescribed exercises. Corticosteroids, let's stop right there because remember when we were learning about um, Bell's palsy, what did we? What was one of the first things we learned about it that was causing this? Yes, cranial nerve seven, but what was happening to cranial nerve seven? Inflammation. What do corticosteroids do? They decrease inflammation. So it makes sense that corticosteroids would be ordered. It says corticosteroids are started immediately. With, with best results if they're initiated before paralysis is complete. And the corticosteroids are going to be very high dose. Patients are going to be on high dose steroids, okay? Uh, drugs should be tapered over a two-week period. You guys know this. You never stop steroids abruptly. What did I write here on the side? I wrote never stop steroids abruptly. Okay, I just said it. You guys know that. Steroids are never stopped abruptly. Patient has to be weaned off, okay? 
So they'll be tapered off in a two week period. Treatment with antivirals. And the reason is antivirals is we have, we strongly suspect there is a correlation with the recent viral infection, the herpes, right? So we're gonna give them antivirals such as a cyclovir for virus, right? The valacyclovir or famcyclovir. When you see it ending that VIR, usually it's an antiviral agent. Just remember that. So we're, they're going to get corticosteroids for the inflammation. They're going to get antiviral agents, okay? It says, has not been effective in the management of Bell's palsy. Here's the thing. They're still ordered. They're still ordered. The patient still gets the corticosteroids and they're still placed on antiviral agents, especially the pediatric patients, if we see the Bell's palsy in the pediatric patients. So should you expect it to be ordered? Yes. They order still order the cortical steroids and the antiviral agents, especially if it's a pediatric patient that has the Bell's palsy. All right. Uh, nursing management, mild analgesics uh, to relieve pain. Now, here's the thing. Usually the patient's not going to have uh, pain, but they may have it if they have um, the herpes. Okay, but usually the patient's not going to have pain. But if they do, they'll get a mild analgesic. Uh, hot wet packs can help reduce any discomfort from lesions if they do have herpatic uh, lesions. You're going to tell the patient to protect the um, to protect the face from colds. Excuse me, I had technical difficulties. You're going to tell the patient to protect their face um, from cold and drafts because trigeminal neuralgia, which is extreme sensitivity to pain or touch, may occur. Remember early in the video, I was talking to you about pain. And once we talk about pain, we're talking about trigeminal neuralgia. I'm going to do another video about that for you guys to know. But the point is, with inflammation of the nerve, that patient may develop trigeminal neuralgia. So we're going to teach them about ways to kind of avoid that from happening. And one of them is to avoid cold drafts um, to their face, okay? Because trigeminal neuralgia is very, very, very painful. We're going to teach them about good nutrition. We're going to teach them to eat foods high in protein, high in vitamin C, drink lots of fluids. We're going to teach them to chew on the unaffected side. Why? Because we don't want them to have food pockets. We don't want them to aspirate, right? We want them to be able to swallow fully. We want them to be able to chew fully. We're going to teach them about the importance of oral hygiene. Artificial tears, I knew we were going to get to this because remember, um, the hallmark sign that we see is a Bell's phenomenon. They're not closing their eyelids properly. So what happens when your eyelids don't close properly? It dries out and you can have corneal ulceration and we want to avoid that. So you can teach the patient about the use of artificial tears and they should be used frequently during the day to prevent drying of the cornea. We're going to teach them about, this is important. I should have this highlighted because highlighted this is a famous test question as well. You're going to teach them to tape the lids closed at night. That can help to um, um, keep those eyes lubricated. Instruct the patient to report ocular pain, drainage, or discharge, especially ocular pain. A facial sling may be helpful. It says down here, the change in physical appearance as a result of Bell's palsy can be devastating. You, devastating. You're going to reassure the patient that a stroke did not occur and the chances for full recovery are good. And guys, that is your Bell's palsy in a nutshell, the most important things you guys need to know. So please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Guys, you can sign up for your NCLEX review, private tutoring sessions, or consultation sessions by visiting my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. You guys catch me on the next video.